Theory of Flight. I'm your host, Ray Preston, and we're continuing our discussion of how the aerodynamic force is created. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, why do you have to keep calling it the aerodynamic force? All those other websites, they just explained how lift is created. Why can't you just call it lift? Well, there's good news and there's bad news. I'll give you the bad news first. The bad news is, there's no such thing as lift. I know you're thinking, uh-oh, this guy's some kind of a crackpot. We better get out of here quick. Well, before you go, at least let me tell you the good news. The good news is, there's no such thing as drag either. Okay, now that we got rid of all those guys who don't have any confidence in me, I'm going to torture you a little bit. Remember high school? I know, you want to forget. But in high school, your teachers used to love to draw graphs like this one. And they always were the same. You've got the x-axis horizontal. You've got the y-axis vertical. Now I'm going to plot a point on this graph. And then I'm going to try to convince you that's not one point. That's two points. So if I tell you that's two points, I'm pretty sure you're going to say to me, Ray, you need to get your eyes checked. There's only one point there. But I persist. I say, no, no, look. It's got an x coordinate, see, x and y. That's two. So there's two points. Now you're going to say, OK, I see what your problem is. You're confused. Every point, one point, requires two coordinates. Every point's got to have an x coordinate and a y coordinate, but it's just one point. I say, OK, you talked me into that. But did you know that we can also use these graphs to plot forces? We start the force at the origin, off it goes up to the x and y coordinate, and by changing the x and y coordinate, I can change the orientation of the force. I can make it rotate like that. I can make it longer. I can make it shorter. I can put, put it back the way it was originally. So we say we define that force by its x and y coordinates. But what if I try to convince you that's not one force, that's two forces? Once again, you're going to say, Ray, I don't know. I'm pretty sure you're wrong about that. There's only one force. But I say, but look, it's got an x coordinate. See, I can draw the x coordinate along the x axis in red. It's got a y coordinate up the y axis in green. In fact, wait a minute. One, two, three. That's not one force. That's three forces. Now, at this point, some of you might actually be willing to go along with me like that. I mean, one, two, three, there they are. So some people would say, there's three forces there. Some people would say, no, there's only one force, and the two components, they're just imaginary. I'm actually not going to take a position on this, because it really doesn't matter, as long as you understand the concept. We've got a force in blue, and it's two components in red and green. Now, we're going to eavesdrop now on an imaginary conversation between two scientists. Since I'm the only one here, I'm going to play both parts and talk to myself. So the first scientist says to the other scientist, oh, I see you have the aerodynamic force plotted on the graph. Said, yeah, I do, and I've got its components plotted as well. There's its x component in red and its y component in green. The other scientist says, you know, these X's and Y's, this is getting awful boring. Reminds me too much of high school. I hated high school. Can't we come up with something better to call it than X and Y? The other guy says, you got something in mind? He says, as a matter of fact, I do. Why don't we call the X coordinate drag? And we'll call the Y coordinate lift. Say, yeah, that's a great idea. That's way less boring than X and Y. We'll call them drag and lift. And we can change the orientation of the aerodynamic force by changing the x and y coordinate like that. Yeah, we can change it any way we want. We can even bring it all the way around like that and put the aerodynamic force right in the x-axis. And then we have a particular case where the x component is equal to the aerodynamic force and there's no y component. Yeah, that's a really good idea because, in fact, that's very common. Most objects in the world are just like that. But you know, there's something else I hate about those graphs. So they always have to draw them with the x-axis horizontal 
and the y-axis vertical. Why do we have to do that? That's so boring. We should be able to just take that graph and rotate it around any way we want. And the other scientist says, well, you know, I'm with you on it being boring. So it's really boring, always, always like that. But we're scientists. We can't just randomly change it. We'd have to have a rule to change the orientation of the axis. The other guy says, do you have something in mind? He says, as a matter of fact, I do. We're going to make a rule that specifies the orientation of the x-axis. And the rule is going to be that the x-axis must always point in the direction that the object is moving. Yeah, that's a really cool idea. Because, for example, the way the graph is drawn right now, that's the aerodynamic force on a rock. And if we imagine the rock right at the origin of the graph like that, then the, the rock would be falling straight down. Hence the expression falls like a rock. And so with the rock falling down, we'd have to take our graph and rotate it like so. So the x-axis is perfectly vertical. That's so cool. x-axis vertical, y-axis horizontal. That would drove my grade 10 math teacher nuts. I love it. So yeah, and so you can see here now that the rock falls down under the influence of weight, which we can't see here. But we know it's there, and we know it acts straight down. And the aerodynamic force is straight up, and the rock will fall faster and faster, and the aerodynamic force will get bigger and bigger, and eventually the aerodynamic force will be equal to the weight of the rock, and the rock's at its terminal velocity. And we could also say that this graph represents uh, a parachute, not one of those fancy modern parachutes, one of those old-fashioned parachutes, just like that they also fall straight down. So when you've got one of these old-fashioned parachutes, you still have to draw the x-axis straight vertical. So it's really going to annoy our math teachers. But what if it was one of those fancy new parachutes like that? Now the aerodynamic force is no longer in the x-axis. The aerodynamic force rotates a little bit out of the x-axis just like that. Now you can see we've got a problem here. The forces are not exactly balanced. The weight is pulling straight down, but the aerodynamic force is pull pulling up and on an angle to the left there. So it's going to make the parachute move in this direction. But since the rule is we have to turn the x-axis to point in the direction the parachute is moving, we're going to have to rotate the graph. And we can even figure out exactly how much to rotate it. We have to rotate it exactly like that so that now the aerodynamic force, once again, is straight vertical. And we know it has to be that way because there's only two forces acting on this parachute. One is weight that pulls straight down, and the other is the aerodynamic force. And unless it pulls straight up, there would be a net residual force, and this parachute would be accelerating. But we observe that it travels in a steady line at a constant speed. So it's not accelerating. So we know we have to draw the graph like this. And we can see the direction of travel. Yeah, that's really cool. And you can even tell that the direction of travel is determined by the ratio of the x and y axis. You mean the lift and drag. Yeah, we can even call that the lift to drag ratio. Yeah, that's so cool. The lift to drag ratio determines how steep the glide is. Now what if instead of one of these parachutes, one of those guys in those flying suits. Those things are really neat. Now the uh, aerodynamic force rotates even further away from the x-axis, something like that. So now we have to rotate the graph around even more. Now in this case, we've drawn it with a lift to drag ratio of 1 to 1. Anytime the lift to drag ratio is 1 to 1, the direction of travel is exactly 45 degrees, like so. So yeah, but you know, there's gliders out there that achieve a lift-to-drag ratio of 60 to 1. If we swap this guy out for a glider, now the aerodynamic force moves even further away from the x-axis. In fact, now it's a lot closer to the y-axis than it is to the x-axis. So now we have to rotate the graph all the way back around like that. And now we can see that the glider is falling, but it's falling at a really shallow angle. Wow, that's so cool. In fact, now it's almost back to the way it was in high school. 
next time I see one of those high performance gliders, I'm going to walk up to the owner and say, these things remind me of high school. Well, maybe not. Okay, that's enough of that. Get rid of the, the graph. Let's have a final wrap up here. So I have to confess that in this episode, I really haven't explained anything. The purpose of this episode was just to clarify the meaning of the terms lift and drag. It's very important to realize that lift and drag are the coordinates. Drag is the x coordinate, lift is the y coordinate of the aerodynamic force. One of the big mistakes that many people make is trying to explain an air, how an airplane flies concentrating only on the lift component. That's never going to work. What we now realize is that every object in the world, whether it's a rock or an airplane, has an aerodynamic force. So we're now focused what we need to do for the rest of this series. Step one, it's a two-step process. Step one, we need to figure out how that aerodynamic force forms. Once we figure out how the aerodynamic force forms, then we've got to figure out why is the lift-to-drag ratio of a rock zero, and why is the aerodynamic force of a high-performance glider 60 to 1? Once we have the answer to that, then we'll know how an airplane flies. So I hope you're interested. I hope you'll come back for the next episode. Until then, I'm Ray Preston, and this is Theory of Flight. <laughs>